But uh, our first speaker is Professor Josh Gert. He's Professor of Philosophy at William Mary. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Before coming to William Mary in 2010, he taught at Florida State for nearly 10 years, and he works primarily in the areas of ethical theory, on accounts of practical reason, and the philosophy of color, which is, I, look, I checked this out because I didn't know what it meant, but it has to do with basically perception. The, the, you know, what, is it, what are you perceiving when you see color, if I understand that correctly? So with that, Josh, please carry on. Yeah, I think I'm up there. And uh, I'd like to assure you that I'm a much more dynamic teacher than this is uh, going to provide evidence for, because in order to try to come in under 12 minutes, I'm more or less going to read some remarks here. Um, and I would like to thank Matt and uh, the Society for inviting me to try to bring some more clarity to the discussion. It's always better to spread information around. Um, my father taught at Dartmouth College for 50 years, and for over 20 of those years, he served on the ethics committee at the Dartmouth uh, Memorial Range Scott Clinic, and he dealt with all sorts of cases that are the kind that um, are typically taken to be instances of irresolvable disagreements, the ones that highlight uh, basic moral disagreements between different people. But he, what, what he remarked was that it was a surprising amount of the disagreement in those cases turned out to be factual. Though, of course, there are such things as disagreements in value, it turned out that once there was agreement on the facts in these cases, uh, and these were life and death cases, very important cases, it turned out that uh, there was a lot more moral agreement than, than one would have supposed. And in the discussions that we've been having amongst the faculty about this uh, curriculum proposal, it, the disagreements sometimes seem to be irresolvable. But I think that a lot of the disagreement here can also be traced to factual disagreements. So I take my role, especially as the first speaker in this panel, to be primarily informational. One thing I've noticed in the faculty discussions, which, by the way, are discussions among an especially motivated group of perhaps 15% of the faculty, is that misunderstandings of the proposal continue to persist. It, it may be that some are very busy and can't keep up with the changes, but it would be a shame if things were determined by people who are not entirely clear on the facts of the proposal. So here's my understanding of the proposed new curriculum in very broad outline. I'll indicate where I think the mis misunderstandings have been. Uh, I'm going to omit parts of the proposal designed to deal with transfer students and with those who come to the college with enough transfer credits and sophomores. I just want to focus on the mainline experience that the curriculum is designed to provide. So in their freshman year, uh, students are going to be required to take one College 100 class and one College 150 class. The College 150 classes are well understood and already exist. They are our very successful freshman seminars, small, writing-intensive courses that are relatively specialized in focus. The College 100 courses, on the other hand, are not well understood. They are larger classes of perhaps 50 students and are meant to be organized around common themes. Um, it is not clear how these themes are going to be selected or whether they are meant to be selected in a way that is relatively neutral as respecting the department discipline or domain. There is still a foreign language requirement. There is still a math requirement, though these can be satisfied before arrival is going to marry. There was a, a center that was mentioned in the executive summary of November 30th. That was a, an administrative center meant to support the faculty in the development of courses and, and do other things wasn't 100% clear. But in any case, uh, that is no longer part of the proposal. And I think some people are unaware of its removal from the uh, proposal. There are three, I take this to be what I'm about to describe, the heart of the new curriculum. There are three knowledge domains currently labeled ALV, CSI, and NQR. There is a rough organizing principle behind this threefold division. The first, arts, letters, and values, is supposed to concern the products of human creative activity. The second, cultures, societies, and the individual, is supposed to concern human beings themselves as objects of study, as individuals, and in groups. 
And the last, the natural world and quantitative reasoning, is supposed to include all the other stuff. The objective stuff that might have nothing to do with human beings except as they are regarded as biological entities. One misunderstanding of the domains, given their initial names, was that they corresponded to the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. But that's not true. For example, the first domain includes many courses in philosophy, and the second includes the social sciences, and the third includes math courses, computer science courses, and also some philosophy courses. All students will be required to take three College 200 courses, which should be anchored in one of the three domains and should look outwards towards one or both of the other two domains uh, in some way. And th that is, they're supposed to be interdisciplinary courses. They, uh, students must also take three additional courses, one in each domain, though these three can be satisfied by AP, IB, or uh, transfer credit. These are not the College 200 courses, these are additional domain courses. And these need not be interdisciplinary. One very significant misunderstanding of the proposal has to do with whether or not every William and Mary class will belong to a domain and therefore could satisfy this uh, second part of the requirement having to do with the domains. Up until the last faculty meeting, it seems that many members of the natural science departments were unaware that essentially all mainstream William and Mary classes will belong to one domain or another. Um, and uh, some people in the sciences thought that only classes in, in the third domain, the only classes in that domain were going to be natural science classes. It's clear, however, and I was working on the working group for the domain descriptions and names that math, computer science, and some philosophy classes belong to this third domain. When it became apparent that classes outside of the natural sciences belonged to the third domain, Pressure from the sciences resulted in its being made clear that College 200 classes must be anchored in, that are anchored in the third domain, uh, have to be grounded in the natural sciences. That's, that's now uh, uh, a clear, made clear by the UC. That means essentially that math, computer science, and philosophy cannot offer College 200 classes that are anchored in that third domain. College 300 classes are meant to expose students to different cultures in something more than a purely academic way. Paradigmatically, this would be through study abroad, or in culturally different, in a culturally different part of the United States, or in the Washington program. Uh, there also will be a two-credit class called the William and Mary Colloquium that would satisfy this requirement. College 400 classes are essentially capstone classes in a student's major. They are also well understood. What is not yet clear is what will happen to students whose major department does not yet offer such a class. Some people strongly favor this new set of graduation requirements, while others strongly oppose it. What I would like to do now is to draw attention to some of the sources of this diversity of opinion, partly to make it plausible that the disagreement is a good faith one, not driven by ulterior motives. One worry that people have about the new set of requirements is that it does not promote sufficient breadth of learning. In fact, that is my concern. For example, because of the way in which the domains are defined, it would be very easy for a student who did not like history or literature or anything having to do with values to graduate from William & Mary without taking a single history class or a single literature class or a single class that require them to reflect on the nature of value. When this worry is voiced, those who favor the current proposal often say that the same is true under the current GER system, since students can place out using AP, IB, or transfer credit. But the worry about breadth is more robust than this, since it is a worry that it will standardly be the case that students will avoid those areas they dislike or are scared of, rather than a handful, it's not a worry that a handful of students will be able to gain the system and avoid these things. It is also sometimes said in response to this criticism of the GER system that it could be fixed just by allowing so much AP, IB, and transfer credit that students can, under the current system, get out of William & Mary without taking classes in these areas. And at this point, 
Significant factual disagreement comes in as an explanation for some of the disagreement about the proposal. Some make the claim that the more requirements there are, and the GER system has 10 requirements, the more resources are required to enable students to meet them. As a result, the choice some hold is between the GER system, in which there is a lot of AP, IB, and transfer credit, or the new system, with fewer distributional requirements, but in which students will take most of the required classes at William & Mary from William & Mary faculty. I am not sure whether this empirical claim is a general truth. For example, there is currently a proposal being debated that requires more distributional requirements by splitting each of the three domains in half and requiring a course from each subdomain, only one of which would need to be a College 200 class, so that there could still be just the three required. Some people oppose this proposal for the more requirements, more resources reason. I think this opposition is based on a false empirical belief, but in any case, the dispute about this proposal is to some extent based on factual disagreement. It would be nice to get some clarification uh, about what the true empirical view is. Another source of factual disagreement about the current proposal is a disagreement about the behavior of students. Some hold that students will, if left to their own devices, experiment with a wide range of courses. If this is true, then the lack of required breadth would not result in a lack of actual breadth. I myself do not share this belief, but it is an empirical matter, and I am certainly not an expert on the psychology of William and Mary students. Another, I wish I understood them. <laughs> Another source of factual disagreement is about what the educational benefits might be of a less broad education in which a student delved deeper into a smaller set of areas as against a broader one in which a student sampled from a wider range. Some data suggest that in individual classes, learning is better when a handful of topics are covered more deeply as against a full spectrum approach. I think this is often right within the scope of an individual class, but I do not think the implications for a whole college career are at all straightforward. And again, the question here is an empirical one that may be the root of much disagreement about the proposal. Finally, and this paragraph is going to end abruptly, I'm just warning you, and that's the end of mine. Uh, finally, there is a genuine evaluative disagreement as to the relative value of depth and breadth. Any curriculum needs to make a trade-off between the possibility of the former and the requirement of the latter. Some people think there is some value in a policy that forces students to take classes in a wide range of subjects, partly because it results in some students discovering a deep interest in something they would otherwise never have thought of examining. I believe that. And some people think that this value is sufficient to justify such a policy, even at the expense of many students being forced to take classes that turn out not to interest them very much, although they may learn something in those classes. Others think the disvalue of a student taking a class that is not that interesting to them, and in which they may not learn that much as a result, is sufficient to outweigh the positive results of such a policy. And that seems to me to be a philosophical difference that is at the root of uh, much of the disagreement about the, policy, about the curriculum. And uh, both sides really have views that are respectable, and uh, I guess that's the last thing I want to say.